we go. It says we're live, but we're alone. But we're not alone, are we? No, we're not alone. Okay. <laughs> we are alive. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So uh, as soon as you start getting here, we'll start going because um, I need two or more with me. <laughs> so, okay. All right. <clears throat> He doesn't Sle count, no. The sleeping dog is lying. The yeah, sleeping dog is lying. We'll let him lie. So, so let's see. What good thing can we talk about this morning? Well, how was your week? The week was was good. It was full, as, as they always are. Um, drama, as well as times of rest and peace and mm -hmm. accomplishment and setbacks and all of the things you get with a, with a good week. How about yours? I'm glad to be alive. It's good. <laughs> I mean, right. I, there was nothing that made me not. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we've we picked up uh, fellow travelers, and uh, we're we're glad to have you with us this morning. I've uh, got the usual um, announcement this morning about our uh, community of faith still online. Uh, we do have community, though. If you uh, if you keep on with the uh, Monday and Tuesday night men's and women's group. You'll have a place to be able to share, <clears throat> excuse me, your successes and your failures and your prayer needs and, and uh, we'll be able to watch out for each other. Mm -hmm. We've had a steady, uh, committed group, which we'd be happy to add you to um, this week uh, for that. Uh, it is Monday 7 onward for women's group and Tuesday 7 onward for a men's group. And, and just a reminder that if if you're not on the list for any reason, just contact somebody to get you on it. Me yeah, or John or that's right. Pastor Word will go Dave. around fast and we'll get you, <laughs> get you your Zoom in, your invite. invite. Yeah. yeah, and then you'll be able to join that. And uh, we're, we're still watching uh, the world around us. Uh, the, uh, the, the COVID is roaring right now, as you know, in our area. And... Um, it, it is uh, going around. Don't be afraid to lay low a little longer if you can. Uh, stay out of harm's way. Uh, it's really better not to catch this thing than to catch it and, and hope that you're one of the many who, who don't have a severe effect. Uh, don't get this thing if you don't have to. And, uh, and so um, this, this uh, latest surge predicted to pass by pretty quickly, but it's here right now. So we're still online. And, uh, and we'll stay that way for the time being. Also remember Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m., the ever humble and vigilant Dave Woods teaching out of Matthew's Gospel. Mm -hmm. So I recommend that to you. Uh, and, and then uh, we've got, uh, if you found your way here for the first time perhaps, find your way to our YouTube channel, uh, Zoe Church San Juan, four words. Do a search on YouTube and you'll find our green ball logo, and, uh, and then subscribe to that. And you'll have access to the last couple years of, of recordings for Sunday morning, whatever. Uh, so find your way there or find your way to our, our website, uh, zoechurch.com. There you'll find a way to contribute to the cause, to the gospel uh, through PayPal, and we also have Zell access, Zell at ZoeChurch.com. So if, I, if I'd have known we'd be doing this for years like this, uh, I probably would have made like a special screen with all the info. So you just look at it and not the busier mind with this, but we didn't. And so uh, that's the reminder for this morning. So we are grateful to be able to connect with you through this uh, kind of indirect means, but we're trusting that the Lord will make it extremely profitable to our souls this morning to gather in the name of the Lord. So with that as our goal, I want to ask Kathy if she'd open us with a prayer this morning. Sure. So pray with me, please. Lord, what a blessing that we have this morning to be able to call on your name and we're not just calling out to the darkness somewhere. We're calling into the light. We're calling in to the living God because of what Jesus has done for us. And even though there's many things we don't fully understand, we who have been rooted and grounded in your word or are being 
there in that place, Lord. We are fully aware that you have our backs, you have our hearts, you have our very lives. Anyone who chooses you, you choose. And I pray this morning, Lord, that your unfailing love would continue to just draw us closer to you. I thank you so much that no matter how long we live, no matter how much our bodies start going down the other side of that hill, um, our hearts and our minds don't need to be in that place. Mm -hmm. Our spirits can be fresh and new every single day because of your Holy Spirit and the work you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for uh, not only the fact that you want us to love you with all our soul, hearts, mind, and strength, but you want us to love one another because you didn't intend for us to be alone. You didn't intend for us to not have um, humans around. And I just pray, Lord, that you would keep teaching us how to love. I thank you so much for songwriters, people who can write worship that we can sing and turn back to you, but also in those songs find the places in our heart that your word comes alive, that through even human um, words back to you, it can trigger something in us, and I just praise you for that personally, Lord. Mm -hmm. I pray you keep the writers writing of your truth and just singing love back to you or living our love back to you. But this morning, Lord, we're here in this place gathered because your word is the most important thing for us to understand who you really are and your character. And I praise you for showing us that in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kathy. Another great and prescient prayer to start us off. Let me just make a couple of adjustments here and get our get our focus uh, proper. And then um, and then at that point, we will read our scripture passages for this morning. So we've got uh, two two scriptures this morning. The first is from Philippians chapter one, uh, verses one through three. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. And then the other scripture for this morning is found in the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 11. I'm going to pick up reading there. Now, uh, the we here is Luke, the writer of Acts, who has joined uh, the entourage just in the verse before, verse 10, and he will continue uh, uh, through this particular section of Scripture with Paul and Timothy and Silas. So, verse 11 of Acts 16 we boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace. And the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, the major city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we, met, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where uh, we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She was baptized along with other members of her household and, and asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at, at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money uh, for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and instantly it left her. 
Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell their jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave, go in peace. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. Let's pray one more time. So Father, we ask that you would keep these electronics all working properly. Uh, and keep our hearts together. Join us in your spirit, though it's over an internet. Uh, we ask that we could um, know you and fellowship in your word together this morning. And uh, we're thankful, God, of the great work that you, that you do, that you are doing. And we're asking that your word would speak to us, as, as Kathy has proclaimed in prayer also, that we're dependent upon you to give us the data for our faith, to give us the data that your spirit will will uh, testify to our heart as real and alive and that we can understand and see through the lens of your truth. So this morning we're asking that you would bless your word upon us in Jesus name. Amen. In 1980s, in the 1980s, there was a particularly productive study uh, within the Academy of, of uh, Christian studies and Christian um, advanced studies and it was called narrative theology. It was um, de being developed very carefully, uh, but it had a lot to speak of it. At the time, the idea of narrative was a bit novel. Uh, most people were still, you know, out of that uh, evangelical mold of, uh, you know, campus crusade for Christ and the reasons and the evidentiary defense of the faith, uh, you know, the arguments that made the faith real and, sh and that everyone should bow to. And the idea of, of studying uh, narrative as a critical tool uh, was not thought to have too much um, uh, productivity. But it was clear to many at the time that, uh, that, that dismissing narrative studies as a critical study uh, was, was uh, not a wise thing to do. The presumptions of narrative study and critical study were very much in line with the believer's belief that God had authored God's word and that we could believe in his word and accept it as his word. And, uh, and yet it was transmitted down through time, down through the centuries 
through human beings who are imperfect and make mistakes. It was copied tens of thousands of times by copyists who sometimes grew weary of their toil. Sometimes they copied lines twice instead of once. Sometimes they left the line out. Sometimes they messed up a word, spelling. After all, they were writing on a wax uh, a parchment with a stylus and uh, easy to see how they would make some mistakes. So it was clear that there were critical uh, uh, studies and tools needed to evaluate differences in texts, to evaluate uh, similarities, and to understand and know with some reasoning what we could trust in and what we couldn't. Narrative studies held that, that uh, particular promise. There was a time in history where, where Christian scholarship had rejected uh, the, uh, the redaction theories. Most of the critical theories that had, that had prevailed through the first half of the 20th century as those which were destructive to the faith, and they were. Uh, the search for the document Q, this unknown document that, that supposedly stood behind all of the Gospels, but uh, was also um, uh, critical in the similarities between the Gospels. Uh, the search for Q was fruitless. It, it was a search for a document that didn't exist, and, and people had grown tired of hearing about it and, and reasoning through it. So, uh, so, so the need for a critical tool to think through things uh, properly was, was obvious to uh, many. So during the 1980s, I did a seminar presentation of narrative theology and, and narrative studies in general and the critical tool of narrative theology. And I was pretty excited about it. Uh, I was pretty excited about the prospect of being able to have a tool where you could evaluate textual variants and differences and, and talk about the reliability of a text and the intent of an author. And, and uh, I was pretty excited about the potential there. And I put a lot into this seminar. I got, you know, I did the, uh, back then we had these overhead projectors where you do the, uh, you present these uh, uh, sheets of mylar and they had writing on them. And I had a pretty good presentation, I must say, a lot of energy. And uh, I think Kathy helped me quite a bit with getting the resources available. But at any rate, I was pretty excited about it. And the night of the um, seminar uh, uh, came, it was well attended. There are a lot of people there. And I, I kind of went through things a little bit thoroughly, talked about what a narrative is, uh, what a story is, how it has plot and character and, and tone and, uh, and, and the elements of stories and, and, uh, and how they could be analyzed and, and looked at and discussed and then uh, made the application to biblical studies and how uh, every single uh, author of scripture though others would try to take apart their writings and say they were written by multiple people, somebody thought they were one person at one time. And why they thought one person wrote something and, and how it held together then could be studied on its own sake, uh, regardless of whether you believed uh, in, in the text or not. And I, and I put all those things together and I had a time of, of discussion, question and answer, kind of threw it open. And I remember a leading couple spoke up right away. And when I say a leading couple, I mean a, a couple that uh, I didn't know very well, but they knew everyone else. And um, everyone I cared about, everyone who was following uh, my ministry at the time or following in ministry at the time uh, and aware of the things that I was doing, uh, uh, they, the, these people knew them. And so when they expressed their um, I wouldn't want to say objection, but it was close to an objection. It was kind of like one of those backhanded slap things. Well, this is really nice, but do we really need this? Uh, come on. It was kind of like a, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like they had listened and I don't know, uh, didn't receive anything. And it really put me on the spot. And, and it put me on the spot in a moment's time. And my full, first impulse was to react to what they were objecting to. And at the time, I remember that's just about all the impulses I had were reactionary. <laughs> uh, I could react to anything. Uh, I, knew, I, knew, I thought I knew how to react and how to react strongly and how to react in a way that would, that would ward off any opposing viewpoints or any opposing anything. And, uh, but this time, I kind of 
held back the impulse. I didn't react. And um, I let them uh, have their say. And I, and I answered with a certain um, graciousness. I decided not to try to pull them over the threshold of belief by strong statements and, and assuredness and, and uh, just convincing them, uh, just willfully pulling them. But I decided to just be gracious to their having been there and, and not, not start an argument, but just be gracious. And as time went by, I realized that the people that I cared most about uh, stayed around, were still around, and those that questioned kind of peeled off and drifted out of most people's lives. And the thing wasn't a problem at all. Uh, had I, um, uh, had, I had uh, a, a different reaction, things might have uh, gone way differently. So if I were to tell you this morning how to think or what to think, you would rightfully uh, throw your guard up for your personal sovereignty and tell me to back off. Uh, I would hope you would do that. Um, but if I were to point out to you uh, in, the, in the direction of thinking uh, critically how you might uh, think at the right moment and give you examples of how it functions, you might receive it and benefit from it. So that's what I want to do this morning. I want to examine this morning an ancient way of looking at relationships and problems in relationships. And I would like to uh, point out to you a way that you might get on solid ground really fast and might preserve things that later you want preserved. So I'm gonna give you an acronym this morning. Now, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about these acronyms. Uh, so if you don't like this one, you think it's too hokey, uh, don't throw it away anyway, because it might be something you could use. It's, it's based on the English alphabet, okay? I'm kind of overdoing Greek alphabet stuff, you know? COVID cursed all the Greek letters. So, so I'm going to do QRST. QRST, you might remember it as a portion of the alphabet, okay? And, and the acronym goes for questionable things that happen in relationship uh, and reaction to them, shame that follows, and then thinking and thankfulness. I'm gonna show you how those things all relate. So, okay, so let me say this again. So something questionable happens in a relationship, uh, whether it's someone you're sharing the Lord with, someone you know, someone you have regular interaction with, something questionable happens. It causes you to question how to respond or how to meet a challenge. Then uh, your impulses of uh, reaction will lead to shame. If you just react to what they're saying or react to the problem that you have, you will end up later having shame over your reaction. If instead you think then you have a chance later of thanking. So let me say it one a third time. So questionable thing happens. Don't react ending up in shame, but think ending up in thanking God. Okay, so uh, we'll get to to that. That's in our text this morning. That is our text for this morning as we open Philippians. But let's do a little bit of um, uh, backtracking. Uh, we actually covered quite a bit last week, even though this is Philippians 1 verses 1 through 3. Uh, last week we saw that Paul moved on. He moved on from his own practice of, of first and foremost trying to convince the Jews that, that the Messiah had come. He had the ultimate captive audience. Those who were seeking out, uh, those who were seeking out uh, his own um, uh, his own audience. They hadn't heard anything negative about Paul. They hadn't heard from Jerusalem to resist him. Now he was in Rome under house arrest, and as he as he uh, sought to explain to them who Jesus was, they they gathered all of the people they could, and they came. And on a third day. 
They sat down and he reasoned with them the morning till night. And, and then at the end of that, they were ambivalent. They, they weren't convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. They weren't ready to follow and learn Christ as their salvation. Uh, they, they were totally ambivalent toward it. Some believed, some didn't. Uh, thank you. And, and so um, at that point then, uh, Paul decided to, to just tell them, look, what you've rejected uh, has been prophesied that you'd reject it. And now I'm going to the Gentiles and the Gentiles will believe it. They will receive the salvation that's here. It was intended for all people, including you, but you've rejected it. And now it's going out to the rest of the people who it's for. And he's moved on. And, and so we we saw him in this place uh, at the end of Acts 28. And we saw him in this place at his own expense for two years under house arrest. And during that time, he welcomed all people who came to hear. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, though he was in the heart of the kingdom of man, the, the world government of the Romans under the emperor. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. And then uh, thirdly, he taught that Jesus Christ is Lord. He taught uh, the Lordship of Jesus as the Christ. And, and those three things uh, were unhindered. He was free in prison to do those things. Uh, we, we pointed out last time also that 10 long years had, had passed and that, uh, and that uh, since, the, uh, in, since the incident we read in Acts chapter 16 this morning, the first incursion uh, into Macedonia, which was in fact the, uh, it was in fact the introduction of the gospel to the Gentiles. First it went to uh, Philippi, then it went to Thessalonians, and then, uh, and then onward from there it grew and developed in Corinth and Ephesus and onward. So 10 years since the introduction of, of the first authorization of Paul bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, cleared by Acts chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem, uh, now he had ventured out on this uh, missions trip uh, to take it across into Europe, the first incursion in Europe. And so uh, what, we've, what we've set about to do is to look at, at these, this two-year period of time and the writings that Paul produced. We're going to call them the prison epistles because that's the, that's the way they're referred to sometimes. They are specifically Philippians, Ephesians, uh, uh, Colossians, and Philemon. And we're going to look at them as the groundwork for the gospel that Paul wants to now seat in the, the, uh, the place of Rome to, to be able to write there what he sees as the future of the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the entire world and even down through time as we hinted at last time. Uh, remember that, that these letters that Paul writes are, are idealistic in the sense that uh, they, they represent for Paul how he wants the, the church to go forward, how he wants the communities of faith to blossom in the gospel. They are ideal in that sense, but they are also very, uh, very much based on his practical reality, his, what, he dis, what he's discovered in those 10 years, the, the introduction into communities of faith, of contamination, the, the uh, personal uh, uh, appropriation by people who are after their own benefits instead of the gospel. The, the, um, the ways in which the gospel can be exploited by others for their own purposes and knocked off track. He has the experience of having seen it in Corinth firsthand. He's seen the church go, go uh, bonkers over their own spirituality and, and actually ruin uh, the church itself, the community of faith itself in Corinth over a period of many years. He's seen that. He's had a restart or redo in Ephesus. He's seen it start there. And, and so he has these 10 years of, of real world experience that temper what, where he wants the church to go and how he wants it to be set in an idealistic way. So we introduced the, um, the challenges last time that we face in trying to look at the prison epistles in this context. We, we want to uh, uh, ask of, of how will 
we uh, testify to the Word's truth, to the truth of the Word? How are we going to tell about it? And, and uh, what are we going to say about it? How are we going to construct uh, thoughts that are communicated to others? What will be our space of existence? Okay, that's a pretty uh, primitive question, but don't underestimate its, uh, its own uh, uh, challenge, okay? Are, are we going to be, are we going to carve out our own space? You know, uh, what was it, 73 men, uh, I don't know, sail, uh, sailed off <laughs> into a place? Uh, uh, are, are we going to find a place, an island, a country? Are we going to um, declare this a free zone for Christianity? How are we going to go forward? Uh, where is our space going to be provided? Uh, and, and more importantly, in today's uh, pseudo-modern era, what is our headspace? What are we to think about the presence of God in this world? What are we to think about our own uh, identity as those who follow Christ and our own witness to the world? How are we to think about that? What will be our ideals? What will be our pragmatics? What will we uh, need to watch out for and be cautious of? What do we need to be concerned about? Uh, and so basically, how we go forward from this place, from this new place in a, in a kind of a new era, are the questions and challenges that we'll be running across when we cover these four epistles. And, you know, if you want a single phrase for your notes, what do we hope for? Uh, that, might, that might be helpful to reduce it. Okay, so... Our new place in history, Paul's new place was a new space. Our um, a place in history is a new space. Uh, we'll talk as we go along about the philosophical backdrop, back, backdrop that we live in uh, with pseudo-modernism. Uh, and, and I don't expect you ever to be comfortable with it, but you know about it. Uh, most of you who, who, uh, who play a video game or, or who go on, uh, online and have a community uh, um, uh, experience with uh, social media. Uh, uh, most people get their news from Facebook, uh, of all things. Uh, so uh, you're familiar with some of the stuff of the pseudo-modern era, whether you've ha ever had it spelled out to you or not. And many of you live comfortably in that world and, and uh, scoot around uh, very, very comfortably. So, um, so we'll... Um, We'll be exploring those things, but not making them the focus. So uh, in our uh, uh, Philippians 1 through 3 uh, verses of chapter 1, we get our first look at the letter, uh, but we already started it last time, uh, as we've just gone through. But, but um, besides last week, we actually started some of it uh, even almost a year ago when we started 1 Thessalonians. Remember, right after Easter last year, we started 1 Thessalonians. Can you believe it's been only that long? It seems like it was like years and years ago, <laughs> but it was just nine or ten months ago, I don't know, since last April. And, uh, but when we started there, I introduced you to some concepts about understanding epistles. And I tried to dismiss with you uh, the scholarship of a previous era, which turned out to be less than profitable in New Testament studies. And that was the, the assumption of mirror reading. So you, you read an epistle, you read a letter, and you try to read the mirror image of it. You try to see what was on the other side of it. Um, you know, an epistle is a lot like a phone conversation in today's time. If you're listening to someone talk on the phone, you only hear half of what the conversation is because you don't hear the other half. Unless you're involved with some other agency that's tapping in, uh, you probably only hear one half of it. And so, um, uh, and, and so what the old uh, way of studying was to take everything that's said and try to imagine what provoked it, what prompted it. Uh, so if, if Paul is saying something about uh, someone's uh, way of thinking, he must have received criticism for this and, and, and et cetera. So you try to rebuild um, the things that provoked and prompted the letter. Okay, the short sightedness. The short sightedness of that is that it only applies to letters in which were written because of criticism, and not all letters in the New Testament were written because people were criticizing them. 
In fact, Paul received very little criticism from the churches in Macedonia, namely Philippi and, and Thessaloniki. They not only didn't criticize them, but here it is 10 years later, and Paul has an, 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 a, an enormously profitable relationship with them, so much so that they've matured and grown together to the point where, where family love in Christ prevails throughout this letter. So, um, so, so understanding that, uh, that, that Paul is not answering objections or not writing to, to, um, uh, uh, not writing to straighten out objections is really important. Um, so there's no mirror reading that, that helps us with it, but you're gonna find your commentaries full of mirror reading. So I want you to be wary of that. Uh, they really were the first fruits of the gospel in Macedonia, Philippi and Thessaloniki. They really were uh, uh, just this blessed response to the gospel and a blessed group of people that started a small community of faith. So in verses one through two, uh, we, we, find a, um, uh, we find an absence of the word apostle in the letter. We don't find um, the word uh, church per se. Uh, at least in the sense that that uh, that it's an institution, uh, the community of faith met in in uh, in Jason's home in Thessalonica, uh, and and in Lydia's home here in Philippi, and so rather than institutional formalities, Paul is writing to them in that setting. So last time uh, we saw that we started with the reason for the letter, and I wanted to do this because. It is the sole purpose for the letter, but it is an important purpose for the letter. So it was an acknowledgement of the receipt of the blessing that the Philippians had decided to do uh, without being prompted or pressured. They decided unsolicited to support Paul's house arrest in Rome. And we looked at that in depth last time. Paul was very careful to say, I didn't ask this of you, and your doing it is a true sacrifice to the Lord. You are truly doing something for the gospel. Now, um, the, the importance of this can't be overstated. Whenever someone funded or a patron in ancient society uh, financed or funded something, there was a reciprocal relationship. Uh, and that reciprocal relationship was uh, there are givers and there are those who are under uh, the compulsion to give what, what, what they were given for. And there's this reciprocal relationship. Uh, evangelicalism of, of uh, the previous era was very much founded on reciprocal relationships. Uh, people gave and expected to have a certain amount of that giving uh, translate into what they were giving for. And so, uh, you know, there was this binding of things. And, and in the many un, uh, ugly and unhealthy uh, conversations that I've been involved with with people through the years, many times it turns to this of, of how much they gave and how much they expected. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really important in, in, uh, in, in following Christ that giving be done to the Lord, no strings attached. And, and uh, give, but give to the Lord, and, and, and support and give as a, as a sacrifice, uh, as a gift to the Lord, and then let go of that gift. It's really critical that that happen, because especially uh, those that give sacrificially, uh, it's important that you invest in God and the kingdom of God, and not invest in people. Uh, it's especially important now, because fundraising has become... Uh, characteristic of pseudo-modern era. This is really about the grand narrative emerging that, that, uh, uh, that finances are the driver of everything. Education, uh, everything there is is driven by finances. That is now uh, stepping up to the forefront. God is not driven by finances. As Kathy has pointed out to me from day one that I've known her, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he's not worried about how uh, things are gonna happen financially. Now, sometimes we worry excessively about that and we can't see the light of day, 
But that's not God's doing. God calls us to trust in Him and to walk with Him. And when something happens, uh, we are to immediately turn to Him and look to Him for His provision. That's what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. That's what the Old Testament is all about. That's what giving originally was about. You give and you give to God. You honor God for what He's given to you, and it's an act of, of pure sacrifice. So Paul said to the Philippians, Hey, I got the support that you sent. Epaphroditus, though some delays, and we'll get to that some other time, Epaphroditus got here, and he not only got here, but I receive uh, from, uh, from the gift that you sent, I received the provision under these terms. I didn't ask for it, and this is given completely to the Lord. This is for him. And, uh, and, and so for anyone down the road looking at this, understand, uh, understand what this is about and, and, and what the terms of it were. Now, why is it so, I don't know, it seems so unfamily-like for Paul to be spelling the terms out like he did last time? Well, um, the reason was because of the perilous nature of what happened in their sending money to Paul for his house arrest. Uh, the travel back then was perilous. Uh, you not only had to worry about everything you owned, but if you even owned a, a bag or a knapsack, it could be stolen from you by thieves and robbers. It was difficult to move money around in the ancient world. Uh, it was difficult uh, for, the, for the issues of theft and for the issues of fraud. People could fraudulently pose as others, or they could just outright through violence steal things. So uh, whenever uh, money, substantial amounts of money were moved, there needed to be uh, authentication, authentication of the people involved, authentication of the transfer of funds. And that's what Paul is doing here in, uh, in the first verses of, of Philippians. Uh, he's He's and, and in that place in chapter 4 that we looked at, he's authenticating the gift and reporting to the Philippians that he did receive it. But he does it in such a way that if something bad happens to him or something bad happens to the Philippians, that this will still be documented as to what the gift was, who got it, where it went, what it was for, why it was given. There will never be a question in history about this gift. And in the church, from the time of uh, Chrysostom onward, in the, uh, in, in the mid-4th century, uh, or later 4th century onward, uh, the, the early church fathers understood that it was the Philippians who financed Paul's house arrest. It was the Philippians who did it, and it was understood why they did it. Not as a reciprocal thing with Paul, but truly as a sacrificial gift to the Lord. So um, we'll, we'll get back to this in a second, but I just want to tell you that, um, that Philippians has been re-examined in the 20th century, and it's been somewhat disassembled and taken apart. Uh, the timing and date of it have been questioned. Uh, the, the Not multiple authorship, but multiple letters has been speculated. Well, maybe these were fit together, multiple writings by Paul or whatever. And a lot of the same criticisms that happen well, with other letters only, uh, it gained some traction with Philippians. But I can tell you that Philippians stands on solid ground as having been written from house arrest. And there are many, many reasons why. We're not going to go through all of those reasons as we, as we go through them. Uh, perhaps I'll point them out. But, uh, but I just want you to understand that in the, in the history of interpretation, we're back on solid ground in canonical studies, understanding Philippians as having been uh, the, the acknowledgement by Paul that the Philippians have made a sacrifice to God and honored God. They weren't particularly wealthy, but they wanted to fund his stay in Rome because they were excited about what would happen. Okay, well, more about that later. So let's get back to Paul and Timothy. Uh, and, and, uh, and the elders and deacons mentioned in verse 2. Okay, I said that in case something happened to Paul or something happened to, uh, or, or something happened to the Philippians. Well, what might happen to Paul? Well, he was at the end of the line as far as his legal appeals go. 
Paul was going to be thumbs up or thumbs down by the emperor. Uh, Paul was going to be either released, having appealed to Caesar, or he was going to be executed on the spot. He had no more appeals. And so at a moment's notice, the guards could come in and end his life. If the emperor had decided at that time, I'm not accepting any appeals, you're guilty, you should be executed. That could have happened uh, after Paul set the pen down. It, it could have happened. Well, what could have happened to the Philippians? Well, the Philippians were, were near in being a part of Europe and being in at the end of this Ignatian way at the, on, a, on a road to Rome, literally across a little John of Sea. But uh, as the persecutions would begin to spread out from Rome against Christians, which no one could foresee in the time Paul wrote this accurately, but they were going to happen. They were brewing. Things were getting tougher and tougher. The emperors were dealing more stringently with the things of Christianity than ever before from the time of Claudius onward. And now uh, Nero was about to lose his mind and lose his patience over Christians and was going to break up the Christian faith everywhere he could find it. And he would first and foremost find it in Philippi. So everybody was under peril. Everybody was under the threat of, of not having assumptions of well-being. And so Paul includes in the people he writes to the elders and the deacons. Now, this is not an institutional statement. The elders were episcopal, the, the overseers. They were the administrators of the local church. The deacons were the ones who watched out for people and their, and their immediate needs, the widows and those who needed the funds. In order to send Paul a large donation, which would cover uh, two years of house arrest, uh, the, they had to be, uh, they had, it had to be authorized, it had to be uh, acceptable to not only the Philippians in general, but the Philippians who oversaw what happened in Philippi, and to those who, who dispersed the funds to widows or whatever, so that they would know this large chunk of money went to house arrest for Paul. This is, this is more or less a formality. Paul is reporting that, hey, what you decided to do has been received here. I've gotten it. I paid for my stay here. And I'm going to write some serious letters now. And I'm receiving this as, a, as an offering that you made to the Lord. And I'm going to receive it also from the Lord as a way to provide for the gospel. All of those are specific things that Paul wanted down in writing to acknowledge so that the money transfer was understood to be complete both by the sender and the receiver. Now for the rest of it. And the rest of it occurs also in verse 1. I am writing to all of God's people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus. So notice that he started verse 1 of this letter is from Paul and Timothy. He got the, he got the uh, receipt uh, stamped. Now he shifts to the first person singular. I am writing. I am writing this to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus. This is something that Paul uh, is rejoicing in as he's writing it. The fact that there is a holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus. Notice he doesn't use an author authoritative term. He doesn't say, well, I'm... I'm, uh, uh, you know, an apostle. Uh, but on the other hand, he doesn't say that the, the people are his. They belong to Christ Jesus. Like we studied in Thessalonians, they, uh, they received the gospel proving they were chosen people. And, uh, and so Paul would recognize he was a part of the spread of the gospel. But so were they in receiving, acknowledging God through his message and walking with the Lord. And, uh, and then in verse 2, he gives this chiasm of a standard blessing. God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So if you follow it running along, you have God the Father and Jesus Christ the Lord. And then the next thing is associated with Jesus Christ the Lord, which is grace. And then uh, finally, what's associated with the Father is peace. So it forms an X or a chi in the Greek. The Father and Christ... Uh, grace and peace. So if you connect them all, how do you like that for graphics? 
<laughs> um, you find this blessing of grace and peace. Both are needed. Uh, grace without peace, probably the grace isn't received. And peace without grace is probably your setup for law. Now, verse 3, let's get on with the heart of the letter. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. This is an awesome statement. I love this statement because it's 10 years after he started working with them. It's a long, long time. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of things that are in the rearview mirror. And he can think about them and he can, he can thank God. He has thankfulness when he thinks. So how did he get to this point? How did this thing start out to where Paul could think about them and thank God? And, and so, um, you know, we read this long section in, in uh, Acts chapter 16, and I'll leave that for you to go back and read over. But there are several things that happened in there where Paul was disciplined to think instead of react. Now, Paul was as much of a reactionary trained uh, Pharisee as anyone. Uh, he could react to anything uh, opposition, first of all, but he did it. And it's seen in this text in Acts. So, uh, so, so he goes to Philippi. There's no synagogue. There's no Jewish people there. There's only a handful. Uh, it's, it's Gentile. It's Roman. It's, it's Roman culture, Roman society. And so he, he asks around. He finds out, well, every, every uh, Lord's Day, People go down to the river and pray. It's a group of people. They're all women. They all go and pray and they seek God. And so he goes down there and he meets, uh, he meets Lydia. Uh, he explains the gospel to her and she receives the gospel. Now, uh, Lydia was wealthy, uh, a seller of purple. There are two types of sellers of purple. And perhaps we'll get into this when we pick up next time. But uh, one seller of purple is from uh, a common source of purple dye. And another was royal purple. It has a special word for it in the Greek. Royal purple was controlled by the empire. <laughs> and I don't mean the Star Wars empire. I mean the Roman empire. The emperor had full control of all purple dye of the highest quality. And it's because it was used for royalty. And so you had to have a special license to, to be involved in any way with purple. And it's very probable that Lydia had connections with the emperor in Rome and had a license to deal with purple and was considerably wealthy uh, in the ancient world because of that. But that money was not enough for her. She sought God. She sought God all the time, at least down by the river uh, every week, seeking God and wanting to know uh, uh, more about God and, uh, and so she, she worshiped God regularly in, in that way. And she listened to Paul, opened her heart, got baptized. And then here comes the first challenge. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, come and stay at my home. Okay. This is where Paul could have reacted at first. He probably was, he probably had an impulse to react. Well, I'm not going to stay with you. I don't want to associate with that. I don't want to uh, you know, I, I'm bringing a message that's, that's, that's linked in heritage to the Old Covenant. Uh, I don't want to do that. And, uh, and his hesitancy for a number of reasons might, might parallel uh, the, the, uh, the, the meeting in Cornelius' house early in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 10, chapter 10 that it's a Gentile home. But, and, and in, at the end of this verse 15, she has to keep urging him. And notice her challenge. She challenges him relationship wise. You've told me that if I believe what you're saying and I get baptized, that, that I am saved, that I'm a true believer in the Lord. If you really believe that, you come and stay with me. And Paul's first reaction was no. First reaction was to react. But he thought through that and in thinking through that, he finally goes there now, 10 years later, when he thinks about how this came down, he is thankful to God. He thanks God always, not only for Lydia, not only for the place where they met, but thankful for his relationship that he didn't like put it back on old covenant terms immediately. 
You know, a lot of times in, in uh, tokenism, in the evangelical era, uh, Christians made a lot about the fact that, that Christianity helped women to come up out of the, uh, the ideals of, of uh, ancient world being property or being objects of use and, and, and put, them on the pla- uh, put them on the plateau of personhood. But you know, the Gentile world allowed women to get rich in the times of Paul. Lydia was rich. She was successful. She was thriving. She was a part of the culture. She wasn't disrespected in her culture. Uh, and, and so uh, Paul was the one that had to get on board. He was the one that had to accept her for who she was. And she challenged him. She demanded that he follow through and have consistency with what he believed. And Paul did. Now, another thing happens in this text where the slave girl follows him and she shouts constantly, uh, almost like this placard, um, you know, this, this man has come to, uh, to, to be a servant of the Most High God and, and to tell everyone how to be saved. So imagine if you step back, like let's say you're on a hill somewhere and you're overlooking, a, you're overlooking this, this group of, of Paul, Silas, Timothy, whoever they had uh, picked up, Lydia, a couple of others, and, and uh, they're walking around and, and this girl is, is, is within the boundaries of the group and shouting out, kind of like a verbal billboard. These men are servants of the Most High God and they have come to help you be saved. Paul at first was like, whoa, that's crazy. And, and his feelings were, were, to, were to stop it. And then, and then he resisted that and he had to deal and cope and think what the issue really was. The issue wasn't that she was making fools of them or that she was revealing something that he'd rather reveal differently. After he thought about it, the issue became her. The issue became her well-being. And he turns to the demon in her and says, get out of her. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus to come out of her. And, and so Paul had thought through his reactions. He didn't give in to his reactions. He thought through and cast the demon out of her and her own well-being uh, is implied here. We're not told that she... Um, we're not told that she got baptized, but we're not told that she didn't. And in fact, uh, the implication from the Gospels and the textual studies are that she did come to faith in Christ, that she did understand what Paul had done, that Paul had indeed saved her. Uh, It's a warning to us about just carrying a message around we don't believe, uh, being on somebody's agenda and just saying the right things, because that's not what gets it. What, what really gets it with God is that heartfelt faith. And Paul, who resisted reaction, could now think back about what happened. And he's so glad he let her keep screaming at least for a couple of days until he could get to the sense of what's really needed here. What do I need to do here? And having thought that through critically, he's now able to thank God 10 years later. And then finally, uh, the, the last thing we're going to look at in terms of Uh, this uh, QRST uh, this morning are the prisoners and the jailer. Okay, so Paul uh, is beaten. uh, And Paul and Silas are beaten to an inch of their lives, as the saying goes. They're thrown in prison at midnight. But they're not there as victims. They're not there angry. Now, we know what probably what Paul was thinking. Paul was probably thinking, well, you know what? I deserve this. Uh, you know, the thing about questioning uh, questionable things is don't question God first. Question yourself. Um, if you question God, you're probably going to react and bring shame on yourself. But if you question yourself, you might start thinking right. And Paul knew that he had persecuted Jesus. He knew that he had uh, uh, been there when Stephen was, was killed as the first martyr, holding the coats of those who threw the rocks. Paul knew that he uh, deserved uh, what he got and more. And, and yet he knew that's, that's not why he was getting it. But he told Jesus when Jesus warned him about suffering, it would be an honor. <laughs> it would be a privilege. I'm not afraid of that suffering. In fact, uh, uh, that suffering is an honor and a privilege. So we knew he was thinking that way. He wasn't sitting there in, in, uh, in prison Uh, or in that prison, he wasn't sitting there moaning, crying, yelling, 
complaining of being the victim. More importantly, he wasn't outraged. He wasn't railing against what happened. He wasn't uh, 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 trying to provoke sympathy. And the scripture tells us that a funny thing that Paul didn't know about was happening. The prisoners were bending their ear. They were listening. How was he reacting to this beating? Whoa, that was quite a beating. He's in pretty bad shape. How is he reacting to this? Reminds me of the Roman centurion who watched Jesus carefully. Watched him so carefully that when he saw how Jesus died, he believed. He understood this was an innocent man. I've seen people die all the time. This man was innocent. I could see into his soul that way. And so for Paul, accepting what had happened, not questioning God's providence here, maybe questioned himself a little bit, did not react to the outrage of what happened, but rather uh, worshiped God and blessed God. And so what's really critical is when the earthquake happened, when all of the uh, jail cells opened up, you, you might say, uh, well, it's great that Paul and Silas didn't leave, but have you ever asked yourself, why didn't the other prisoners leave? They didn't leave because they were listening to Paul. They were listening to him while he worshiped. They were wondering, why does this guy worship after being beaten near death? And so as the jailer went to kill himself, Paul could say, we're all here. All of us are here. Maybe they came to Paul and asked him, should we run? Should we hightail it out of here? And Paul said, no, you should just stay where you're at. Maybe there was even a verbal communication of that. But now, 10 years later, Paul could think back and go, I am so blessed that, that, they, that the prisoners didn't run, that the jailer, I was able to save the jailer by giving him hope. I was able to lead him to Christ. I was able to baptize him in his household. And as Paul thought back about the whole Philippian situation, he could thank God, mainly because he didn't react in all these places. And that's the point I'm trying to get to you this morning, that part of our existence in today's world is a lot of thinking. It's a lot of understanding, trying to see uh, uh, our past history, trying to understand, trying to get valid clues of the reality what's real and what's not real. And in doing that, that, that critical thinking, and you understand when you see God, when you see God in his work, you should be able to thank God. You should be able to, to understand that, that God's way and that, that God's doings here are pure. And, and that in doing that, um, you will result, uh, you will have as a result a healthy mind, a healthy mindset toward the reality around you. So um, all of these things and more were a part of the gift that the Philippians sent. It may have been that Lydia, that uh, this slave girl who was delivered of a demon, that the jailer, that the prisoners in prison, they may have all been part of the community of faith that heard about Paul's imprisonment, heard about his need, and, and realized we are going to pay for his house arrest. And not pay out of pity or outrage that this is wrong, but because they knew what good things could result from Paul being in prison. They knew firsthand that Paul has the gospel. And because he has the gospel, it's just going to go someplace else now, someplace deeper, darker, someplace where sin abounds. And so we want to be a part of that. We want to give to that. We want to support that. We want to support uh, Paul. We're here to give. Paul understood in prison that their salvation 10 years ago uh, resulted in now they're happy to give to the gospel. And Paul is blessed now that he can have thankful, thankfulness and a thankful heart when he thinks about all of it. Would you pray with me? So Lord, our epistle to Philippians starts with Paul thinking and thanking God. And Lord, I wish that for all of us, we could think more. I wish there were time for us to think more. 
but I wish that when we do think that we could see more of your work, more of your hand. And I wish, Lord, that when we develop the narrative structure of our own witness and understanding of ourself, that we'll have less and less things in it where we reacted and brought shame to ourselves and more and more things where we thought through things. And now we're thankful. We're so thankful of the way things happened and the way things went down. So I pray, Lord, as a result of this morning's message and studies, that you would bless our thinking and you would bring about in it thankfulness. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you now. I pray your thinking would be good this week. I pray that you would think about things from your past that are real, that involved God, that he was a part of. And in those most difficult of relationships, I pray that thoughtfulness would be a part of your interaction and your response. In Christ's name, amen.